And with that, let's move forward, ladies and gentlemen. Coming up next, we have Arjun Malik from Malik Architecture joining us next. Hi, good afternoon. Thank you for having me here. And thank you for, uh, you know, um, I made a little request for them to take the picture off. It's a bit strange to, to talk to you guys with that, that fellow hovering and looking at the back of my head. And... Uh, if any of the people from the office are here, sorry, now I know how you feel. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll wash out. Um, I'm going to talk about just a, you know, a single project, uh, the House of Solid Stone. I'm not sure if you guys have you know, seen it before. Or, um, One second. I think Ananya spoke very eloquently about um, a particular situation, right? Uh, Udaipur, this is, this is uh, Jaipur. It's not too different, but... Um, it's a bit of a tricky situation for us as contemporary practitioners that we have all of this inspiration. Um, and I think what's difficult is to, is the idea of interpretation, right? That when you, you look at all this, this remarkable history and um, it would be so easy to appropriate, you know, superficial iconography from these situations. Rather, if you begin to imagine them as, you know, uh, I think very intelligent architectural constructs, whether it's, whether it's step dwells, which are, you know, it's, they, they, they store water, they become social spaces in the summer, whether it's courtyards, uh, whether it's jollies, it's privacy, it's air, whether it's uh, load-bearing walls. There is much to learn from this building intelligence, these extant building traditions, and I think it's kind of incumbent upon us um, as practitioners to perhaps try and look a little bit deeper into these memories and into these spaces to find something a little bit more um, robust and essential beyond, you know, surface treatments. And uh, so I'm not going to spend too much time talking about the plans and sections of the house. That's not really the, uh, the primary topic over here, but it's a... Uh, it's about a 5,000 square foot plot as part of Mandava Enclave. It's not too far from the center of Jaipur. It's for a single family. It's actually a close friend. Um, it's about seven and a half, eight thousand 8,000 square feet of house with a ground floor, a subterranean space, and two levels, right? Um, I'm just going to kind of quickly jump through these. So I think the story begins here, right? Um, Ananya would know, I think, a lot more about this than I would. In fact, I'm going to step over to Udaipur and learn a couple of things from him. But you see, they, they're used to historically quarry stone in a very particular way through, uh, you know, hammering dowels into pieces of stone, and they would keep hammering them, hammering them until the stone would split along its natural grain of weakness, and therefore you'd get these beautiful textures of the land coming out. And now with the requirements of stone that the building industry has, they're into these diamond tip cutters and gang saws, and you can quarry remarkable quantities of stone very, very quickly, but everything is essentially textualist. So you get these powder face finishes. So you're taking this beautiful natural material, and then you send it to the factory, and then you keep cutting it into tiny pieces, and then you start decorating them, and you finally take what is essentially this amazing, dense, powerful material and we have through our, you know, the remarkable intelligence of our fraternity, and yes, I am being sarcastic here, uh, we've taken this beautiful material and we've made it into millimeters, centimeters, and inches, right? So in a way, this is kind of a, you know, a, a reversal of not doing things differently. It's just trying to understand how things worked. You know, maybe you learn to run before you walk, you kind of learn, you repeat, and then you start to improvise. Um, the quarry, the quarry uh, owner, he abused us a lot because he's saying, you architects, we used to do it in this nice way. Now you've come and done it and, you know, with these, with these gang saws and now you're asking me to go back. So we literally went back to uh, harvesting the stone that we need for this project from the quarry with the dowels, with the, you know, the, the water pressure and just basically getting beautifully textured piece of the stone that could come from the quarry 
to the site without going to the factory, which also means less processing, less cost, more economic viability, less carbon impact, et cetera, et cetera. Now, we're used to producing, I mean, even, even in a place like Rajasthan, our first instinct anywhere in this country, irrespective of, of uh, all this accumulated building intelligence, is that we will build in concrete or in steel in frames, and then we will start to infill and decorate and, you know, and the moment you begin to even evaluate the possibility of building in stone, uh, you kind of have to recalibrate everything that you've learned both academically and practically because whether it's the engineering process, whether it's the building process, there are hundreds of drawings just like this with each piece of stone coded. Um, we don't even know what size of stone to work with. You know, with bricks, you have two or three sizes. It comes out of the, uh, out of the molds. You know what to work with. The first piece of stone coming out of a quarry is 22 feet by 6 feet by 7 feet. So what is the stone brick size? And that's where... I think the theoretical structural engineer uh, kind of falls to the wayside and you start to talk to the mysteries because they've understood this through experience, through generations uh, of working on this material. Um, he told us that a particular size of stone is the maximum size that can be handled by two laborers or two masons without any additional machinery. So that essentially became the DNA. And then of course you have custom stones for L's, U's essentially, uh, yeah, you, you're, you're talking about building an entire basement plus uh, two-level house entirely out of solid stone. Every single component, no cement, no steel. Well, there are two steel members for a cantilever, so I, uh, I've been told to be completely honest about that. Um, but yeah, I, I think it throws up a lot of questions, you know, because I can see that the craft narrative right now is, is so dominant, um, whether, whether self-generated or whether imposed upon us from the outside, the search for identity and for soul. And uh, I think we know by now that we are countries within countries, cultures within cultures. There is no binding identity. I think all we can do is begin to perhaps just look at honesty of place and perhaps a certain uh, sense of, you know, mining history and memory. Um, yeah, so whether it's vaulted systems, floor slabs, cavity walls, uh, everything essentially, uh, it kind of really breaks down the relationship in an interesting way. It's just, you know, a person and material and tools. It's, uh, it's quite strange to even visit a building site and you're kind of confused as to whether you're building something or whether you're discovering an archaeological ruin, you know, and it kind of, the whole thing uh, is kind of a, you know, temporal dissociation. There are no cement mixers, there's no dirt, there's no foam works, it's just uh, almost like building up through um, a Lego set. And yeah, I think in a way it's just such, uh, this is an interesting piece uh, you know, stone that we, we brought back, so they, they cut a section of one of the, uh, the springing stones for the vault, right? And uh, you can see the, the drawing and the actual section of the stone, and the fact that you can actually cut your blind reveals, your window reveals into solid pieces of stone. Uh, what fascinated me about this was I didn't know how the texture developed, right? And uh, the mystery explained to me that, you know, the, the stone that you're seeing right now was essentially a base on which they were putting other stones and then cutting them. So just the, the fact that the grinder would go through each time and cut through the texture and you got these kind of remarkable, um, you know, finishes that were not really, you know, prescribed or doctored in a way. I think, I think the sense is that when you begin to let go of the role of architect as this kind of author and you, you, begin, you begin to view it more as an enabler or a catalyst, these, these wonderful moments happen um, on their own. Um, we have used steel sh stainless steel shear pins for seismic, uh, for seismic performance. So every single element, whether it's the... Um, I think most of these are hand cut, some of them are water jet cut. Uh, the stone screens, they're also operated, uh, you know, you put them on sliding folding hardware so you can open and close them. A simple thing like building steps, you know, normally we cast them in concrete or we build a wall and then we put dowels and we anchor them. You can't, you can't build that way anymore. Each of these stones have to go into the cavity walls whilst the walls are coming up. So even in terms of uh, just orchestrating the entire construction, understanding the sequences, um, we can't claim credit for this. We know very little about this. The mysteries are really the boss uh, on this kind of site. So cavity wall constructions, this is quite interesting because if you look at the way that load-bearing structures traditionally work, you would start from heavier walls and then you would keep stepping them inwards as you got taller, right? Now, 
that that system and we, we we did kind of you know study it it was just consuming too much tone it was making the project financially unviable so we developed a cavity wall uh, you know a single section which would work with an 18 inches so you had a 6 inch thick external stone th a 6 inch internal stone and then a 6 inch cavity the original system was supposed to be interlocked for lateral loading but we found that would impinge upon the cavity. There would be too much thermal transfer and we wouldn't be able to run our services through cavities. So we essentially just worked uh, with the interlocking shear pins. But we've got, look, when you're building a house with, you know, infill and brick and plaster and stuff, you can keep doing all your zari work and doing your services and conduiting. But here there's no plaster, there's no paint, there's no fault ceiling, there is nothing applied. It's just that the, the structure is the architecture, is the building, is the interior, right? It's a... Uh, uh, you can look at it as a kind of tectonic construction or I think it feels more stereotomic in terms of almost an excavated cave. Another engineering situation, we had a, a single stone of about 5 feet by 12 feet cantilevered off two ends and uh, the structural engineer was like, no, no, we need brackets, we need brackets and the mystery said, no, we don't need brackets. And uh, the mystery won. This is how we proved this point. These people were jumping up and down on that piece of stone. Yeah, and that's, uh, I mean, these were taken about four years ago. They have been living there for a while. Uh, that's the only part which had two steel sections for the cantilever, which also I think the mystery said he didn't need, but I think the engineer refused to budge. Um, I think this relates back to, I, the first time I went to Jaipur, I was very, very young, and of course we did the entire circuit and we were taken to all the havelis and the palaces and... Dad took me to, and we spent a lot more time at Jaigarh and Nahargarh, right? And those were the two that really, that, that sit in the memory because they were, there was, there was something magical, soulful, monumental, powerful, melancholic about those spaces that I did not see with all the visual noise of some of the other spaces that I encountered. And somewhere when we began to work on this, it was those memories that were actually playing up of working with something very, very spartan, very, very essential, almost architecture as an expression of everyday life, everyday construction, everyday material. The people who've built this home are from the surrounding villages. The material has come from very close by. It hasn't been processed. Uh, we're very lucky that the client's friend and his site next door was empty so we could use it for a stone fabrication yard. The house opens, it closes, it insulates, it breathes. And there's this wonderful kind of, and I, I think a very simple, honest, un, you know, doctored the conversation of texture and smoothness. Um, the screens open up, the spaces breathe through and through. Uh, as Ananya said, I think in terms of the frugality of material, the, the material that comes out of the stone when you're cutting, it goes into your terrazzos. There's something already... Uh, you know, there's a, there's a sense I get when I walk through very ancient spaces, and I don't get that often in contemporary architecture. It's very rare. Perhaps sometimes with Scarpa or Corbusier, some of those buildings have given me those sensations. And uh, when, when I walk through this, and yes, of course, I'm biased, uh, but you still get that sense of a kind of ruin in the making. Um, it's very... It's interesting to look at it from, you know, the life cycle perspective. Uh, the stone walls on the outside, which are the courtyard walls, are the stones that essentially came out of the ground. And it's interesting because the villages, the, the surrounding dwellings all work with the smaller, redder stones, and they're all stacked up in these, uh, you know, uh, the, the rubble masonry of the boundary. And the language, the character, the scale, I think, derives more from the humble dwellings, uh, the villages, the forts, and not so much from the grandness of palaces um, and havelis. And uh, yeah, there are, you know, eight to 10 degree temperature differences between outside and inside. It insulates beautifully. Uh, this house is probably going to be around for about 150, 120 years. At the end of that, it can be completely upcycled, it can be restored, it can be retrofitted in a way you treat it, not just in the design and the building of it, but finally in the retrofitting of it, uh, also as a kind of ruin that can be preserved through generations and added to. And 
Yeah, I think you also just let people who know the subject better sometimes, you let them be. We don't determine the coursing of the stones, they, they do it themselves. There's a magic that happens just through the authenticity of and the naturalness of a process. Um, yeah, and finally, as I said, if you, if you kind of get off your high horse and stop being an author and you become a catalyst, uh, you know, amazing things can happen. Thank you.